please welcome to the stage, Mark Dunkelman. So when I was graduated from college, I didn't know what to do with my life. A bunch of my friends were chasing jobs on Wall Street, some were looking at consulting firms. I did something way worse. I moved to Washington. Before long, I had a terrific job, actually, as a staff assistant to a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee. And I was in charge of some really important decisions like um, what sorts of ballpoint pens the senators would use when they were scribbling on the dais. <laughs> Felt pretty, like I was a pretty big guy, pretty, doing important things. And I'd fly home sometimes to see my folks in Buffalo, New York, talk to the provincials. <laughs> and, uh, at one point, my dad sat me down and he said, you know, Mark, I love hearing about all the adventures you're having in Washington. But I have to ask you, what is it you people think you're accomplishing down there? <laughs> Seems like you're doing nothing. The country's falling apart and you guys are just arguing with one another. And I, I understood where dad was coming from. I'd read that in the paper somewhere. And so I said, dad, you have to understand, money has become a, uh, politics has become a money game. All these politicians are going, they're trying to raise money, trying to do whatever their big-pocketed donors, deep-pocketed donors want, so they can't get anything done. Dad said, you know, Mark, I've read that too somewhere. But, you know, I was reading about Woodrow Wilson in 1916. Pierre Dupont was so angry that he had imposed a federal income tax that he gave $100,000, this was 100 years ago, $100,000 to Wilson's opponent. And frankly, throughout the course of my entire adult life, people have been complaining about money and politics. So that can't be the new boogeyman. Maybe it has some effect, but it can't be the reason things are so bad now. Hmm. I hadn't really expected Dad to come back with that sort of response. So I, 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 I went to a second idea. I said, Dad, well, you know, what has changed is the filibuster, you know, where a single senator or a group of senators holds up the entire Senate agenda because they oppose a bill. That, that used to be pretty a rare occurrence. Now it happens all the time. It's routine. And my dad said, yeah, Mark, you know, I, I've heard that, that ex explanation as well. H have the Senate rules changed? I might have worked in the Senate, but I had no idea. <laughs> dad said, they haven't. They haven't changed since the 70s. So the question is, why are senators choosing to filibuster now? What's different? Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't really have a response to that either. So I went to a third explanation. I said, Dad, I'll tell you what the real problem is. It's gerrymandering, where members of the House of Representatives sort of mess with the boundaries of their districts and make sure that one is entirely Democratic and the other is entirely Republican, and then you've got incumbents who can't be beaten. And my dad said, oh, so you're telling me that an institution of American democracy that is so old that it is literally named after James Madison's vice president is the reason that politics is broken today. Uh-oh. <laughs> Over three. So I did what any 22-year-old who's a big shot does in that situation. I stood up, I looked Dad, looked at Dad, square in the face, and I said, Dad, that's a real ugly shirt, and I stormed off. <laughs> that's how I won that argument. When I flew back to Washington, it stuck with me, though, the question. Why was Washington broken? What, what had changed? I began thinking it more and more, and kept on reading the same editorials and the same op-eds and the same complaints. And then I began watching TED Talks, where everyone was talking about thinking outside the box. So I decided to do the same thing. So I've come up with a theory, and I want to share it with you. Imagine for a second that your entire social universe had to be mapped onto a diagram that looked like the rings of Saturn. So you're the planet, and your most intimate contacts are in the innermost rings, and then everyone else moving out till the Outermost ring is, for me, maybe the guy who checked me into the airport yesterday, who I'll never see again. Everyone else fits somewhere in those rings. Every day, you and I get up in the morning, and we have to choose, how are we going to spend our time? Which rings are going to get our attention? Some of us might choose the innermost rings, the people that we're most intimate with. Some of us might choose people we don't know very well at all. Some of us might choose people in the middle, people that we know on a familiar basis, right? people who are familiar but not intimate, people with the PTA. Then I began to think, how is it that Americans collectively are choosing to spend their time? 
Has that changed? Are we investing in different sorts of rings? So I spent several years trying to figure this out. It's actually sort of a hard thing to measure. Like, this isn't six degrees of separation, right? It's not just knowing someone, it's how intimately do you know them. I've essentially come up with a, a three-part argument, three, three big ideas. The first is, we are investing much more heavily in our inner ring relationships. The 10 or 12 people that we know best. What's the proof? Well, think about text messaging. When we think about text messaging, we think we've got this new technology that allows us to communicate with lots of different people. Turns out that the broad majority of text messages are with people that we know very closely, right? We think that we're able to contact people we don't know. In fact, we're basically just texting dad for a ride home. Secondly, we're investing much more heavily in the outer ring relationships people we don't know except to cross a single common interest. So I'm gonna admit something here that I rarely admit in public. I am one of 17 Cincinnati Bengals fans. There are only <laughs> 17 of us. And we all know each other. Not intimately. There's one guy who I see on the blogs and whatnot who, whose handle is, uh, is the Steelers, uh, well, for, for the purpose I'll say, the Steelers aren't my favorite 419. And so I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about the Cincinnati Bengals every week, hours. I spend a lot of time, and we all do, a lot, lot of Americans are finding some issue that they're really interested in, how to crochet, a cooking club, whatever it is. People that we don't know very well. The third argument is the most important, and it relates to the first two. Because we're spending so much time in the outer rings and in the inner rings, we're spending less time in the middle rings with people who are familiar but not intimate. So why is that? Well, it used to be that you had to go to the PTA meeting to find out what's happening with the PTA, what's happening at school. Now you can check a Facebook page. You don't have to spend all that time going to the meeting. It used to be that when I or my parents had gone on a business trip and they got to the hotel at the end of the day, they'd go down to the bar and they'd have a conversation with somebody. Now you can FaceTime with your children, which I did last night. My daughter spent the entire time asking when she could get off FaceTime so she could go back to watching Peppa Pig. <laughs> Can't have it all. Turns out there's actually scientific evidence that backs this up. The General Social Survey, which is a survey that's been, uh, been done for decades here in the United States, has been asking a question for, for, for a long time. They ask respondents, who have you spent a social evening with over the course of the past month? Interesting results. First, they found that when they asked um, if people had spent a social evening with a member of their family, that figure's actually going up. People don't generally expect that. They asked people, have you spent a social evening with someone who lives sort of outside your own neighborhood, like a friend? Also going up. The percentage of Americans reporting that they had spent a social evening with a neighbor has actually plummeted. An interesting shift. Now, how does that relate back to my father's question about why Washington is broken? Well, I think it all comes back down to the question of what makes American democracy work? What's the sort of secret sauce? I think it's, it is that we have this huge, diverse country people with all sorts of different points of view, different concerns, different backgrounds, different demands. And the system works that they send a representative that reflects their point of view to Washington. And that person is assigned the task of wheeling and dealing and bartering and trading to get the best deal for their community. Not standing on principle saying, I will only have it my way, but figuring out some sort of way to accommodate other people work together. 1997, President Clinton and Newt Gingrich came to a big budget deal, big balanced budget deal, where they negotiated and negotiated and, and both got something that they wanted. Clinton got huge new investment in health insurance for poor children, big new investments in higher education. Gingrich got a big cut in the capital gains tax rate. They did the deal. Neither side was particularly happy about what the other side got, but they did the deal. A couple of years ago, John Boehner and President Obama tried to do the same thing. No dice. What's the difference? 
Well, read the newspapers and it's all about personalities. So and so was wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't wouldn't come to the table. Wouldn't negotiate this. Not nice. Whatever, calling names, huffing and puffing, whatever it is. Maybe that's true. Some of it probably is. But there's something else going on as well. We, all of us, are sending representatives to Congress with different operating instructions. We're telling them today, don't compromise. Stand your ground. Be principled. If you do compromise, we'll be angry about it. We'll send you home. What's, what's the difference? What's changed? Well, I think there's a big chasm between thinking that the person who's sitting across the table from you, who has a different point of view, is wrong, and thinking that they are totally wackadoodle. <laughs> big difference. If they're just wrong, then maybe there's some way to work out a deal, right? Maybe there is. If they're wackadoodle, can't. No dice. Can't do it. Send the country spinning out of control. Now, how do you bridge that chasm? It doesn't happen in the inner rings, generally. Generally, you know, among the people who you're most intimate with, you know what they think. You've talked to them before. They've offered you their ideas. Also, it doesn't happen in the outer rings, with the Steelers are not my favorite for night. <laughs> that person, you never get to have that conversation. It happens in the middle rings. It happens when a college professor who's really focused on income inequality walks into a coffee shop and has a longer conversation with the owner who's really focused on how small business regulation is going to put her out of business. In the course of that conversation, they may not come to an agreement about what should be done or who they should vote for or anything like that, but at least they'll say to themselves, you know, that person has a point. Income inequality is out of control. Small business regulations are not particularly friendly to people who want to try something new, entrepreneurs. American democracy is premised on a community level strength. It's premised on middle ring relationships. And those relationships have begun to wither. That's the change that my father noticed. That's the root of the cause. A bunch of years ago, a political scientist at Stanford named Jim Fishkin, brilliant guy, came up with a really interesting way to understand American democracy and how it works. He then proceeded to give it the most boring possible name. It's called deliberative democracy. I'm sorry, it's called deliberative polling. It's so boring that I got the name wrong. <laughs> Here's what Fishkin does, and it's really smart. He gets a big community of people who are divided about some issue, how to reduce their carbon footprint, how to balance a budget, and he pulls a whole bunch of them into a hotel conference center, and he pulls them, where do you stand on this issue? Then he divides up the group into smaller sections, 10, 15, 20, 25 people, who are representative of the larger disagreement, right? They're people who disagree with one another in that room. And he throws them into a breakout session, breakout room, and lets them talk for about two hours. Then he pulls them again. Now, I don't want to promise you that when they come out of those rooms, they're singing Kumbaya. They're not. Right? People have opinions, and they've got points of view, and they stick with them. But interestingly enough, three quarters of the time, three out of four times, the people have some substantive change in what they think. I think what Fishkin is doing in these experiments is recreating the kinds of conversations that used to happen organically in American community. The kinds of conversations that used to happen in PTA meetings, while you're sitting in a, in a bowling league, while you're doing something with people who you don't know real well. It's very tempting to spend our time complaining about Washington and going through the litany of explanations for why things are broken that we read about in the paper all the time. Money and lobbyists and recalcitrant politicians and idiot politicians, and all the other stuff that we talk about all the time. But I think if we really want to understand what's going on in American democracy, in American democracy today, we need to look somewhere else. We need to look in the mirror. Thank you. <laughs>